mainly Germany. So, you know, it was like segmented like Welcome that. to the Arts and Antique Radio Show, where your host, nationally recognized certified appraiser and Elizabeth Richard Stewart, Santa Barbara's the- treasure sleuth, will help you put a value on the treasures in your own home. Every time it rains, it rains pennies from heaven. Don't you know each cloud contains pennies from heaven? So let's find out how valuable is it? Hello, 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 Santa Barbara, it's your shit. Hello, 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 Santa Barbara, it's your chantress of everything valuable and beautiful, Elizabeth Stewart. And I had to get in touch with Christina Carl at the at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art because I heard that a senior lecturer, a senior curator of European art to 1800 St. Louis Art Museum, Judith Mann was coming to talk to us uh, in the series Arts, Art Matters. And I thought, okay, why is that a familiar name to me? And I thought, okay, I... I I was just saying to Dr. Mann before we went on the air. So I was born in St. Louis. I had a lot of family in St. Louis. And my dad was uh, in St. Louis, not not doing all that well in this last couple of years. And so I used to go back every six months or so to St. Louis. While I was there in 2017, I happened to see a show that Dr. Mann curated, which was called Learning to See Renaissance and Baroque Masterworks from the Phoebe Dent Wild and Mark S. Wild Collection. And it made a big impression on me. And I thought, wow, it was masterfully put together. And there, the theme was a theme that was dear to my heart, first of all, the era. And second of all, the idea that learning to see is in conjunction with the growth of humanity in the Renaissance Baroque era. It just was such a cool exhibit. So I said to Katrina, I w- would like to interview Judith Mann. She kindly put me in touch with Dr. Mann and here she is. And where are you? Where are you, Dr. Mann? Are you in your office in St. Louis? Um, I'm in my home office. Um, so today, yeah. Some and, they, and, we are allowed where to it, home some days. Webster I Grove. See. Webster, Webster Grove. Grove, all right, yes. So, and Dr. Mann's been with the museum almost 35 years. Is that correct? Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, it is indeed. It's amazing. And I just have to say she's um, got so many credits, but just a quick one. Um, the Association of Art Museum Curators and the American Academy in, in Rome awarded Dr. Mann the Samuel H. Crest Foundation Affiliated Fellowship to allow her to study this really interesting part of um, art history, which is both scientific and artistic, painting on stone in Rome. And we'll talk a little bit about that because she's recently curated a show at, uh, uh, we'll just call it SLAM, it's St. Yes. Louis Art Museum. That's what we call um, it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Painting on Stone Science and the State Sacred was a show in 2022. And I want to talk about that. But she's bringing to Santa Barbara a talk on Artemisa Gentileschi. And if you guys remember the famous, uh, first of all, this is a female painter, the famous painting of... Um, Judith decapitating whole furnace and she's holding the head on the pl- on a platter and there's a bloody knife huge and this is was seen throughout my college years as a real statement of female power and uh, strength and might and basically that was the only even though you know I was studying art history um, through my through my graduate years, that was really the only piece by this artist that I knew. And um, that's sad because she she has such an interesting life. She's the daughter of a painter. And uh, this is in the 17th century to Italy. She's the daughter of a painter, but what she what she lived to be a painter, what she lived through and with in the 17th century is another story that it was sort of overshadowed by the power of that one image. Mm-hmm. And so um, Dr. Mann is gonna talk to us about new understandings about the artist and her life in the 17th century. 
And I just want to start, Dr. Manoff, tell us, can you give us like a little pricey, Dr. Manoff, what her world was like? What was her what was her day like in the 17th century? That's an interesting way of putting it. I mean, she was in a household with three brothers and her father. Um, her mother died when she was 12, so she took on so many of the responsibilities of the household. I think she was both running in many ways the household as well as the main um, assistant to her father in the artistic workshop. So she was making brushes and grinding colors and doing all of that. Um, for women at that time, life was quite restricted. She didn't go out without a chaperone. She didn't just have free run to uh, walk around Rome and see what she would want to see. And of course, that's been interesting for us who study her work to really understand what she could have seen while she was growing up in Rome, because she was born in 1593 and was in Rome until uh, 1612 when she married and moved to Florence. So those uh, first uh, 13, four, or her early life, uh, 20 years of her life, what what she was able to experience, we, we don't entirely know. But so her days, I, she worked very hard. Um, I think her she makes this debut in the city of Rome in 1610, so she's 17. She presents, I'll be showing it in the lecture, a, an amazing uh, painting of uh, the Old Testament heroine Susanna. And it, it demonstrates that she was obviously ardently studying the, the female nude. So probably from her own body, um, there's been some debate as to what access she would have had to a mirror, but we think probably she could have uh, well studied her body and her face. So her treatment of the human form was really masterful. She really um, exceeded it uh, in um, uh, representing it quite well. So she um, was taught by her father, but I think a lot of it was her own industrious um, study as well. Do you mean that in her father's atelier or studio that there were no life models at all for her to study from? Did he not have female life models? Um, he, we know from uh, some testimony that was presented at a trial that he had life models, but they were seem to have been male, and it's not clear that they posed completely disrobed either. Um, one of the classic reasons given for why women don't excel in the um, representation of the human figure was that they weren't allowed. When there were academies that actually did involve girls, women were not permitted to attend. So that was always limited for them. So she was left to her own devices, I think, as to what um, she uh, was able to see. Interestingly enough, Although we know it's documented that Orazio had live models before him, it doesn't mean that he was really paying close attention to what they looked at like, because his human figures aren't, they look very naturalistic, but when you look closely, they it doesn't uh, match what a human figure really does. Where hers do, she's very much an attentive observer of uh, human form, so. May I ask, so um, Orazio is, uh, it, it's his studio and she's grinding paints and preparing canvases and this sort of thing. And she's studying her own female form. She's not allowed to <clears throat> be participant in the study of any uh, disrobed male. Mm -hmm. uh, did she ever paint a disrobed male? Um. We have some male figures. Um, we don't have a complete nude male by um, her. So um, unclear, unclear. Um, you okay. know, that's a kind of subject of debate as to how, which women and how much access they had to the uh, male form. Of course, they're looking at sculpture. Uh, they're, um, that's the classic way to study the human form is through uh, classical sculpture. So she did that. And that goes right back to your point of what she was allowed to see in Rome, I guess. Mm -hmm. So was she allowed to see, uh, I imagine there's, you know, there's so much public sculpture in Rome. 
Was she allowed to, to, to study those? Do you know, Dr. Mann, if she was? Well, I don't know if she had an opportunity for prolonged study. It's un We do know of, you know, she would go on outings with people and things. I mean, you know, she, so she wasn't free to go off by herself. Probably, I think her father recognized her enormous talent, and it was in his interest to cultivate that talent. So I, I think he probably would have uh, made it uh, available to her. Maybe he himself went with her to, to study and sketch. One of the big issues or, or questions we have is, here's a woman who studied and knew well the human form, and yet we have no drawings by her, and that would be the uh -huh. way that you learn and you study, but so far no drawings have been discovered. So we don't know. Oh, interesting. That was sort of a, a question I had when I was preparing for this. If her father ever sort of, and I don't want to say this is pejorative, but purloined some of her work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I honestly think it's a bit more positive than that. I think he had a lot writing on her reputation and being accepted as a, a major artist. So he helped improve some of her paintings. I think he might have. I don't think that things were put out under his name that were hers. I, we don't have any evidence that that happened. And do we have any of his drawings? Um, we have evidence that he made drawings because he made tracings and reused them and it's been demonstrated, but we don't have any drawings per se by him either. No. How interesting. How fascinating. Well, Richard's giving us the sign we've got to go to quick break. I just want to reintroduce. I've got the honor and pleasure of speaking with Dr. Judith Mann, Senior Curator of European Art at the St. Louis Art Museum, who's bringing a talk to the Santa Barbara Museum of Art about Artisma Gentileschi. And this is going to be an, a really interesting talk because she's revisiting this wonderful Baroque artist uh, who is a female and who had a uh, cloistered, I guess, life. It differed from our lives as females today, for sure, and how she learned her art um, and why, why the world needs to look at it again is an important question, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so Richard, let's go to quick break. I, I'd love to hear Dr. Van explain why why this topic is important to us now. And uh, I think I've got a feeling why for me, but mm -hmm. um, I'd love to hear what she says. So let's go to quick break. We're back in a minute with Dr. Mann. The lecture is March 7th at 5.30 p.m. at the museum. And I'll let you guys know all you have to do is, is get, go to tickets at sbma.net. And it's at the Mary Craig Auditorium. Um, and they're always extremely reasonable or free for members. So that this is, you know, an opportunity to hear something wonderful from a seasoned curator of the Broke Art. Don't turn that down back in a minute. You're clear. Okay, big boy. <laughs> What's I his name? Pop. Oh, new. His name is Blinks. His name is what? Blinks. Brinks? No, Slinks, like Slinky. Oh, Slinks, like a Slinky. All right. <laughs> yeah, but I didn't name him. <laughs> Oh. It would have been something like Dante had I got a hold of him first. <laughs> anyway, so Dr. Ray, can you see? I don't know. Oh, yeah. Is. That's right. There they are. Right. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> That's Isn't that cool. That was that was right after seeing your show. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Oh, it's terrific. Really. Yeah. Yeah. Can you and you can you can see St. Yes. Louis Skyline. Theater. Skyline. The Skyline, um, yeah. St. Louis. Yeah. That's perfect. I don't know. Can you see a little plane? Oh, right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And there's the people waiting by the, oh, by the yeah. door. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit of, of link. Of a link, yeah. You never know, do you? Never know. No. 
how how life is it coincidence? Maybe not. <laughs> so. Oh, and we we have to we, you have to go at ten thirty. So maybe we'll talk a little bit more about Artemisia, and then could we talk a little just a little bit about the paintings on stone? Sure, I would love to. Yeah. When do you fly in to see us? Well, I'm going to Los Angeles on Sunday and uh, going to the Getty actually is cleaning uh, Artemisia, uh, is repairing an Artemisia painting that was uh, damaged in the um, explosion at Be Beirut Harbor. Um, so that's going to be fascinating to see. And then I'm driving up to Santa Barbara on uh, Tuesday. Okay, we're coming back in three, two, one, you're live. Welcome back. It's Elizabeth Stewart, and I'm talking with Dr. Judith Mann, who's Senior Curator of European Art at the St. Louis Art Museum, um, better known as SLAM, my home museum. That was the first museum I ever attended. I grew up in St. Louis. She's coming to talk with us on March 7th at 530 at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. Artemisia Gentileschi is the topic of, of 17th century female Baroque artist. Uh, and what that what she what her life was like as an artist and, and I'm learning something about this that, that I always thought that her her father was sort of the evil the evil stepfather kind of figure where even though not a stepfather but that you know, he was taking advantage of her multitude of talents but it sounds like it was to his favor to take advantage and to teach her and uh, so she really, yeah, that's that's different than I ever thought. I want to know why this topic now, Dr. Mann? Well, certainly one has to think of the Me Too movement and uh, sort of where women are today. I think Artemisia is a fascinating figure. I think there's a little too much emphasis right now on how successful she was. She was admired and celebrated, but it is she really had to use her um, and she was very clever and working with patrons but she never reached that nice easy relationship with a patron that she could rely on having um, a, a steady income that she would have a, a someone uh, regularly seeking her work but she was really uh, such a um, well, a bit of an entrepreneur, I guess, is how she marketed herself. So she's a, a fascinating example, but she shows us how <laughs> uh, one woman was able to sort of carve out this amazing career for herself. Uh, but yet, when you also look at the value of her paintings today, uh, her father, people are probably aware that the Getty bought one about, I don't know, 10 years ago, a painting by Orazio, the father, for $34 million. And it was only in 2014 that one of Artemisia's paintings sold for more than a million dollars. So um, her her prices, and, and at the time when they were alive, she was paid much less than he was. So um, it, it was uh, not a fair affair. Uh, existence by any means. And could we say that she was the better artist? You know, that, no, uh, the, neither one. They are such different artists. So my uh -huh. the way I know Artemisia is because I, we, I did an exhibition looking at her father and her together, because at that moment, people used to say, oh, you can't tell one from the other. And I thought, no, that's hardly true. They're very, very different, very different aesthetics. Uh, yes, at the beginning, she is trained to paint like him. Um, and uh, she, she I think, is a bit more creative in her interpretation of stories and things like that. But he he's actually a fascinating painter, uh, a beautiful formalist, uh, very, very different. So I really don't think you can compare them because they're such different tastes. Some people gravitate to her work and others gravitate to his. So she's dramatic and feisty. He's not. <laughs> the um the show that Dr. Mann is talking about, Orazio and Artemisia Gentileschi, father and daughter painters in Baroque Italy, opened at Rome's Palazzo Venezia. And the show was later seen at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and then also at St. Louis Art Museum. <clears throat> so she's referring to that. And she actually um uh received, I think it was because of the show, 
uh, the Association of Art Museum Curators Outstanding Monographic Exhibition Award. So uh, actually, that was for a different show, but uh, it was for a different show. For what show was that? That was for Federico Barucci, uh, a, okay. a, a 16th century painter, wonderful painter, but yeah. And I want to know before we have to go, because I know your press agent is saying we got to break at 1030 now, but I want to know the, the painting on stones, the art of painting on stone. How did this capture your imagination, Dr. Mann? We bought a painting in 2000 that was a little painting on a piece of lapis lazuli. And I we had a donor who wanted to buy it for us to help us purchase it. So it's wonderful. Not something I'd thought about before, but as I began to investigate, um, I realized that this was a whole aspect of Renaissance painting that very few art historians had looked at. So I wanted to do an exhibition that showed all the different kinds of stones that artists use, the different places in Europe in which artists use stone supports, uh, and just how marvelous they are. They, they really are just uh, amazing uh, works of art. And, and you're studying m m this majorly in Rome, right? Is that the center for this kind of medium? That's where it really starts. And then uh, it's picked up um, by a number of places in Europe. But yes, it, Italian was a huge place. And, and in Rome in the, around 1530, the first person to really master a way to reliably make paint stick to stone because it, it, it wasn't a given. You had to kind of... Uh, work on your technique to get it to do to work. And where do you study when you go to Rome? Well, there, the study was in churches and in collections. Um, I, I was also, there's a marvelous German library, the Herziana Library, American Academy, where I was um, had a fellowship, also has a marvelous uh, library. So I was, uh, but I was doing a lot of just walking around Rome and looking at uh, paintings on stone surfaces. I was looking particularly at altar pieces done on stone because I realized that if you go to the trouble to create an altar piece on stone, because you use small pieces of stone, they had to construct them. It's quite an elaborate enterprise. It'd be much easier to paint it on canvas. So I knew there had to be good reason that this meant a lot to artists and patrons. It wasn't just an aesthetic thing. It, it, it Stone conveyed meaning, and and they understood that. Now, may I uh, hear that again? Stone conveyed being meaning, meaning, meaning. Uh -huh. Yeah. So don't it, convey, and so and just very quickly before I have to let you go, what meaning did the stone? Was it because it's the most solid structure? Because it's it lasts forever? Is there is there a metaphorical meaning here? Yes, um, it, it, that's one meaning it had. Yes, it, in a time when the Reformation obviously is threatening uh, the Catholic Church, this was a way of demonstrating that the the principles of the Church of the early Church were maintained uh, through the 16th century. There was a sense of the durability of the Church, and stone was a way to um, reinforce that idea. It also referred to the stone that Christ's body was put on because for a lot of these, these are, are altar pieces that depict some aspect of Christ's passion. Uh, and sometimes it was uh, uh, to make a comment because it was used for portraits. And sometimes it was to comment on the character or the importance or the family of the person depicted in the portrait. But it, it almost always conveyed some extra meaning and and our uh, where is that where is that show that show is did, did it tour has it happened um, yet uh it it was held in uh the spring of 2022 there was a sort of second version of the show that was held at the galleria borghese i worked with the people at the borghese and they kind of reconstituted the show um there so it was seen there in the uh, fall of 2022 so well, Dr. Mann, thank you so very much for speaking with us. And just another shout out on March 5th, or sorry, March 7th, correct that, March 7th at 5.30 p.m. at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art, we are having a lecture on Artemisia Gentileschi. It's called New Understandings with Dr. Judith Mann. And uh, interested, go to tickets, sbma.net, tickets.sbma.net.
And we'll, we'll see you there, Dr. Mann. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Oh, you're very welcome. I look forward to seeing your listeners at the talk. It'll be fun. Thank you. Sure. Bye. Bye. So, Richard, we're going to go to quick break, and then I've got uh, another gang coming on. And we're going to be celebrating a, a new show that's happening in Ventura. Fractured Actors is coming on. And um, so let's go to a quick break, and then I'll rally the, the, the next gang. All right, you're clear, and I'll let them in. Stand by. Hi, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. So some of you are on um, video and some are not. Oh, there we are. Okay. That's great. It's, it's, I, I would love it if I could see you because it's easier to track who's talking. Mm hmm. Erica, let's see, Erica. You've got yeah. a oh, here you've got a uh, um, a code to give me. Jeff is saying, I do. Uh, the code <clears throat> for KZSB listeners is KZSB fifty five zero KZSB five zero. That's fifty percent off all tickets opening weekend, March eight through ten. Okay, excellent. Eight through ten opening weekend. Okay. And they okay. can get tickets at by following fracturedactors.com. So that's where they can go for tickets. Got it. Yeah, I got it. A, an email from Jeff this morning directing me there. So that's that's perfect. And then so what we'll do is we'll introduce we get on the air, we'll introduce everybody. And then <clears throat> do we do we have a dialogue prepared at all, Erica? Um, we we don't. We have um, cast here from uh, various scenes and so on, but we didn't get uh, folks scheduled. We okay. were all in so, the scene at the same time. So, so Mandy's there, Lindsay's there, Cassie's there, Erica's there, and Spencer's there. Okay, perfect. So I'll introduce everybody. And then um, I would love it if Erica could, could give us just a little pricey about what the what the play is about. You bet. Okay, excellent. Well, no, maybe we'll start with Erica and she'll she'll tell us and then I'll introduce the cast. Yeah. All right, stand by. We're coming back. Coming back in three, two, one. You're live. Welcome back. This is Elizabeth Stewart. And one of my favorite theater groups, Fractured Actors, is here. Um, Jeff Ham got in touch with me and said, you know, they're, we're doing a really cool show by Alan Ackborn a sci-fi rom romantic comedy called Comic Potential and uh, directed by Erica Connell. And I find out, I'm looking back into Erica's background, and she was with Drama Dogs. And I wonder if um, if uh, I interviewed, when I was interviewing Bonnie years ago, if I ever interviewed Erica, I'm, I'm sure I saw her um, there. But Erica is going to tell us a little bit about the show itself. And by the way, if you take out a pad and pencil, because... If you give a code when you go online and you want to buy tickets and you give a code, and I'll give you the code, you get 50% off tickets the opening weekend, which is March 8th through the 10th, when it's always the most exciting. So, um, and the code is going to be KZSB. So just like our call letters, KZ as in Zebra SB 5050, that code, when you go on to fracturedactors.com, uh, for your tickets, that code will get you 50% off. So um, let's introduce Erica first. And Erica founded Fractured Actors about eight years ago. She has a degree in directing. And like I said, worked with Drama Dogs for, for a number of years. She's been um, with Fractured Actors as a playwright, or sorry, an actor, director, producer, and board member. And um she is directing this show, so I thought it'd be appropriate for her to tell us a little bit about what the show's like. In the light of all the information we're hearing on the media about AI, and yesterday I was thinking about preparing for this show, 
Erica, and um, I have a news feed from Artnet. Artnet's got this show that's happening at a museum in Scotland in Perth, where they're taking picked. The Picts were a Scottish clan in the fifth to the eighth century. They're taking Pictish skulls and using AI to rebuild what the faces look like. Hmm. Wow, these, interesting. Is, yeah, and I'm, I'm I'm thinking about your play, <clears throat> and I'm looking at these faces, thinking, wow. And there, you know, there's that fine line, Erica, between creepoid and actual representation of the human. That's right. They call that the uncanny gap. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was falling into that gap, believe it or not, looking at those faces. But anyway, tell us a little bit about Comic Potential by Ackborn. Sure. It is um, a place set in the relatively near future. And a young writer finds himself at a, a TV studio, like not even a TV studio, branch line TV, where a, a kind of washed up director who directed great comedy uh, back in the day is now working. And um, and this young writer is, you know, wants to do comedy like this director did back in the day. And in the course of their discussion, he discovers um, this particular actoid at this studio. They use um, actoids, which are uh, robot actors to do the soap opera e uh, daytime TV there. And um, our writer falls in love with this actoid and wants to write comedy for her. And, um, you know, hilarity ensues on this journey that the actoid takes, um, which is our, our Lindsay playing JC, who, um, you know, takes a journey from being a programmed uh, actoid machine that reads lines back uh, on cue to uh, really becoming um, a human-like, actoid with agency. So uh, the play explores the question, really, what makes us human? And um, when it was written in 1999, I think that uh, Alan had a focus on kind of the isms, the other isms that we do in our world, racism, sexism, uh, both, uh, you know, play pretty heavily in the film. And we started doing the play in 2020 before we were shut down with COVID. And that was really a time, you know, there was some AI discussion and so on, but not like uh, in the last probably year and a half. So here in 2024, felt like a great opportunity to re-up our show. And with the with the spotlight right now on AI and ChatGPT and what's what's happening with that, um, I think it's an even more timely opportunity to look at these issues. Um, and so that's that's the show. That's in bold today. Mm -hmm. Lindsay Reiterager Nickel. Am I saying your name right, Lindsay? It's uh, Rutherager Nickel. Rutherager. Okay, Nickel. Lindsay, um, you're playing the actoid. One of the actoids, yes. JC333. Okay. So you're JC333. And I just want to just give a shout out. She. Um, I think I've interviewed you before, but anyway, I definitely did the Speakeasy Project when you guys did that, the, the Fractured Extras Speakeasy Project. And I also was a huge fan of Red, and I see you pr were a producer on, on that show that Fractured Actors did. Um, and so my question is, so you, I'm thinking of those Pictish AI renderings of faces based on skull shape that are, is at the Perth Museum in Scotland. I'm thinking of that. I'm thinking of the um, the way that they can move. I mean, they're, they're computer generated. They they talk and move and scare you to death. But at any rate, <laughs> do you do anything with your physicality to indicate you are not completely human on stage? <laughs> yes. Mm. Well, uh, we did make some choices in this production um, because this is a this is a future time where the technology has been so advanced that the actoids really do look to the outside person and feel to the outside person like a real human being. Um, so to differentiate, there is the beginning of the play where JC, when she is not in one of her pre-programmed roles, 
she is a little bit more uh neutral um she goes to kind of a neutral uh more stoic physicality um because she was made to play out these roles and that is her purpose and she understands that's her purpose and so she at that time is uh operating under her programming under her um processed understanding of that programming and has not started making choices that differentiate yet throughout the play she does start to explore and discover her agency and some of that neutrality when she is not in one of her roles starts to fall away and she starts to discover where she is finding uh the real her the her that is not the program she's dissected out the program and now she is discovering that she can make choices and discuss and create her own story. So I, I just have a, a question. You said you're, you're one of the actoids. Who are the other actoids? We have I'm other one of the actoids. Sorry, yes, I'm Andy. one of the actoids. <laughs> <laughs> I play more of a supporting role of an actoid that I am only controlled by a program. Um, okay, yeah, I, so, so that's Mandy Coleman speaking. And uh, Man Mandy, if, if you can hear her beautiful quality of voice, she's a voice actress. We talked a little bit about her children's book narration last time we interviewed fractured actors, and mm -hmm. um, she's playing one of the actoids. So go ahead, Mandy. Yes, I'm one of the actoids that's only controlled by a program. I play two um, roles as the actoid. I'm the mother of a son who has had a terrible accident. And she's completely devastated by this. And I also play the farmer's wife, who desperately wants a child, but for some reason she cannot have a child. And I also play another role as a lady in a dress shop. And uh, she is uh, pretty self-absorbed and uh, slightly inappropriate with what she thinks is appropriate. It's pretty funny. <laughs> Are there any other actoids with us this morning? Okay, are there any male actoids in the show? There are in the show. Um, yeah, like uh, Mandy, there's a, a male actoid counterpart that plays um, the uh, farmer uh, to her farmer's wife in one of the storylines that our, our writer writes up for the show. And then in the beginning, um, he plays the doctor and uh, she's the mother and then the son. So we have another actor playing an actoid there who's the son in that role. So I think we have three, um, let's see, four with JC in a few scenes. So the audience gets a picture of how this uh, future world works with the daytime TV recording situation. And then in the control room, of course, we have the the humans who are running, running the joint and they um, also figure prominently in this story because they have, of course, been in this work environment where actoids are are it, you know, you never say he or she, you only say it. In fact, Cal Cassie is one of our, um, of one of our uh, programmers in the control room. And um, she can probably tell you a little bit more about that because that's her line. You know, that's when I was line. driving, <laughs> Cassie, I, I wanna just put a question to you. What I was driving at was, I, I just thought it was amazing. Having just spoken with um, a guest lecturer who's coming into Santa Barbara, from a show that she mounted uh, in Rome, and uh, she's uh, uh, Dr. Mann is, is going to talk to us about Artemisia Gentileschi, who was a female artist in the 17th century, and how very difficult it was because she couldn't even go out unattended. She had to be chaperoned if she wanted to study, you know, any anything in in Rome regards like the sculpture and the form of the human body. And I was thinking about that as I was talking with. Erica, and then I was talking with Lindsay. I wonder if Eckborn said, I'm going to make the lead actoid a female for a reason. You know, with all the baggage that we have, we're programmed as females in a way. And mm -hmm. I was thinking, I wonder if that's part of the story. Anyway, Cassie, let me just introduce you quickly. She's playing Prim Spring. She's, as we said, a, a programmer. Um, she has been with many of the shows that uh, Fractured Actors had, has done. Uh, she was Sylvia in Sylvia, Miss Frank, in the Diary of Anne Frank, et cetera, et cetera. And I read with great interest, she has a um, chihuahua mix. 
<laughs> I do. I also should have clarified. I'm so sorry. So all those parts that you read off, those are with other companies kind of throughout, um, basically during when I was in California and Colorado. But this is my second show with Fractured Actors, technically. <laughs> and what was your first show? Uh, I was on the Speakeasy. Okay, then I, that, I thought I recognized you. Yes. Okay. <laughs> anyway, Cassie, so you're pro, you're playing a programmer in Comic Potential. So yes. tell us more. Well, um, I do want to say um, when Erica was putting on this production in 2020, I was a part of the original cast. So I'm very happy that this finally gets to go up and I get to have my my part back. Yay. <laughs> I feel like my character, Prim, she is very, she can be very uptight. She's very by the book, but she also wants to do right. So with this particular role, it's a lot of expressive verbal dialogue and even so just a lot of physical movement that really keeps me on my toes. She's been a very interesting, fun part to play. That's for sure. <laughs> I was thinking about that. Your name, Prim, wasn't Prim the, um, the android on in Blade Runner? Wasn't she the beautiful blonde android? Wasn't her name Prim? Oh, I'm not sure, but if so, thank you. <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think she was, uh, she was, you remember, she was the the ac um, acrobat. Oh, uh, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Richard's giving us a sign. We got to go to quick break. I want to speak with Spencer when we get back from the break, because he's sort of the love interest, I think. <laughs> well, uh, not no. exactly. That would be a turn of story. <laughs> right. Uh, that's oh, I, I say it tongue in cheek. So when we get back, we'll explain. Hey, Richard, let's go to quick break. When we get back from the break, we're going to talk with Spencer J. Frederick, who plays Marmion. Um, and uh, by the way, he's got his credits uh, also to his name. But we'll talk when we get back from the break. Don't turn that down. I'm talking with Fractured Actors, their show, Comic Potential. Um, and basically, you're going to go to fracturedactors.com. A shout out, the code for KCSB listeners, if you want 50% off on the opening weekend, which is March 8th to the 10th, code is KZSB50 when you go to fracturedactors.com. And the theater company is in Ventura. And um, it's a it, you, the hashtag, not a church play. And we can tell you why that's why, <laughs> why it's not a church play. But anyway, get back from the break. Spencer's going to tell us why he's not the love interest. Don't turn that down. <laughs> so can you see? Oh. Oh. Cute little honey. Oh. oh I should go away. <laughs> it's my seat cushion. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm a dog person, Cassie, for sure. Oh, can't live yeah. without him now. That's very true. That's very true. Um, so did we speak? We spoke with Mandy a little bit. Um, and Spencer, we're going to speak with Spencer. You the know, only other um, thing I'd like to mention is the connection to silent film and the physical comedy um, stuff, which, yeah. is really, which is really part of Spencer's, a uh, big part of, of, of Spencer's fun, really fun role. So. Okay, so why don't we do this, Erica? Why don't you introduce Spencer and why that's an important part of his role? You got it. That, that'll that'll work, yeah. Perfect. I like that. <laughs> Good. <laughs> but Spencer, you are a great love interest. Oh, <laughs> thank you. I think I think I've had my time with that. Yep. Now we're moving on. <laughs> Moving, moving right along. I mean, he's my love in interest in the show. Technically, so. yeah, technically, so. that's right. I need. To, I, I wouldn't call it the healthiest of marriages, but you know, it's it's certainly a marriage. <laughs> what? I think our marriage is great. Hang out at the dress shop all day. Take me to fancy restaurants. <laughs> you know that is true. That that is true. He he does put up with so much. <laughs> The things I do for love. <laughs> so this little, this little pup is new to me. He's not, well, he's about a, been new to me about a month and a half. And um, he's quite a shock to the system because 
I've had dashans all my life, but I, when they leave me at, you know, 16, 17, 18, 19, somewhere in there, when they leave me, they're mellow. And I remember my dashans being so mellow, but he's not even two yet. And he's bing, 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 bing. I mean, just the energy level is incredible. And I forgot, you know, I forgot what it's like to raise them. I remember what it's like to have them very mature and, and uh, knowing everything about the household and you, you know, and this one is just, but I'm smarter now and I have him at, um, at smarter and I have more money now, but I have him at uh, school and he's at school four days a week and he's learning how to be on a leash and how not to whittle and, you know, um, how to come with, you know, how to sit, all these things, you know. <laughs> this breed is very, I don't know if anybody knows this breed, but this breed is extremely headstrong. You know, is your, is it your, are you a, do you have a Chawini, Cassie? You, it's actually, it's funny you mentioned that. So she's, we think she's a Chihuahua, like Jack Russell mix. However, oh. my husband has always had dachshunds growing up. So we're thinking maybe our next dog is going to be a Chihuahua dachshund mix. If we can find one that we can rescue. <laughs> So we will see eventually. <laughs> so when I was looking for, his name is Slinks. When I was looking for um, Slinks, because my my boy, my older boy passed away, I was looking for Slinks. There is a Chewini as of what, about a month ago, there was a, a female Chewini at uh, DAWG in Santa Ynez. Oh, darn. <laughs> yeah. So, so you could look her up. All right, Eric, uh, Elizabeth, you're uh, good to go. You have uh, you. seven minutes in three, two, one, you're live. Welcome back. It's Elizabeth Stewart, and I'm speaking with Fractured Actors Theater Company. They're a wonderful theater company full of talent and energy and Ventura. And uh, they're producing a show called Comic Potential by Alan Ackford, originally penned in 1999, and it has a lot of relevance now regards to the fact that these are actors, that some of them are actoids and they're programmed to do a role. And in the light of all the things we've been going through since, um, well, since the show was program was supposed to open pre-COVID, in the light of all the movements, the isms, as Erica says, um, you know, this is a really prescient show and it's funny. And Erica was going to speak a little bit about the physical comedy that's involved in the show and using going to use Spencer as a as a case point. Go ahead, Erica. Yeah, another wonderful thread in the show is um, about, you know, looking at comedy. So our young writer, uh, Adam, in the show is a great fan of of the silent films. So we have a lot of references to the James Finlayson's and a little little study on uh, Buster Keaton and that sort of a thing. And um, and then, you know, kind of looking at how comedy has evolved and in the current state of the show, um, there are comic things that happen that you can program, you know, actoids to do, but not real comedy. So it was an invitation to us as a cast to explore that kind of physical comedy and bring in a lot of the kinds of things that Buster Keaton would do on screen um, into the show. There's uh, Pratt Falls and double takes and even a pie in the face. So um, why that reminded me of Spencer so much is because his uh, primary role in the show is as the assistant to the man who owns and runs this whole studio and many others. And in, in the, in the world of the play is, uh, you know, the uh, AI genius of the time. And um, and this fellow, Lester, has an assistant played by Spencer called Marmion, who interprets his words, who is connected to him and um, speaks for him because Lester is a very, very old and very, very wealthy man. So he can like afford to have another person speaking for him. And Spencer, in addition to being a wonderful voice actor, is a wonderful physical actor as well. So um, maybe maybe Spencer, you can talk about your experience uh, being Marmion. Yeah, um, I do love the fact that you brought up uh, Jim Finlayson and Buster Keaton specifically. Um, playing the role of Lesser is our very own Alphonse, who is absolutely 
fantastic as this playing this uh old man and what i love about our dynamic that we do on stage is that when he is lester he is very funny but it is all very subtle very small motions very small motions of the hands raising of the eyebrows flinching very small things but i have to act in my opinion as the big force that he wants himself projected as so i almost play the jim finn lace into his buster keen with these very big pronouncements and i to say sir and uh a lot of pointing a lot of gesticulating and when i got started with the uh, theater many many years ago my primary thing was doing the big shtick slapstick over the top and now uh, playing this role it has been a very, very refreshing return back to that picking the scenery out of my teeth kind of performances. So it's it's been an absolute delight. To add to that a little, what's wonderful about that dynamic, um, as Spencer described his role, um, and, and he is the voice of uh, Lester, played by Alphonse, who does an extraordinary job as well. It is as if for it is as if one character is is two people there, where Spencer is the voice of the character and Alphonse is the physicality of the character. And while um, it is perhaps maybe a little understated, it's he, it's so wonderfully done. The way these two actors are in sync with each other, one with the physicality and one with the voice, it's really a delight. You know, all like, without. Basically- see- all without seeing each other's faces the entire time <laughs> either, since he's in a wheelchair the whole time. <laughs> That's right. It makes me think of the dual nature of theater, you know, com- comedy and tragedy. So you've got the Janus face, you know, mask of where it's divided straight down the middle. So it begs the question, maybe one of you can can answer this, it begs the question. So within this comic potential, is there a tragedy at work in any regard. Ooh, I think I think Erica can absolutely yes. take that one there. <laughs> I would say um, less of a tragedy, but more like um, the comedy allows us to look at some heavy subjects. Um, in particular, <clears throat> excuse me. In particular, um, you know, JC's on this journey of um, being from being a robot who is programmed to do everything to realizing that she has emotions and thoughts and feelings that she's not programmed with. And by the end of the play, it sort of steps into her agency as a um, actoid who is very human-like. So it's not as if she turns into a human, but um, kind of moving in that direction. And because it is a female character, there's a lot of undertones in there about women stepping into um, their agency and kind of our social constructs about how we've, you know, decided in history who has agency and who doesn't, who has power and who doesn't. And um, we're at a time right now where I think we're we are realizing that, um, you know, everyone has a voice and agency and, and how do we change our thoughts to be able to support more of that in the world. Just one shout out before we have to go March 8th to the 10th, if you are uh, KZSB 50 is your code. If you want 50% off tickets, March 8th through the 10th, the um, show goes on uh, March 22nd to the 24th, Friday and Saturdays at 8 p.m., Sundays at 5 p.m. Extra matinee performances are available, too, on the 16th and the 23rd of March. And you can go and find all this information, fracturedactors.com, Sweet J Theater in Liminal Ventura, on Palma Drive in Ventura. And this has been the Fractured Actors theater company presenting comic potential should be fantastic. Thank you guys very much for coming and speaking with us. I, I, I feel like it's a really good time. To Hi, I'm Chris Cullen. Watch. I'm Lisa Cullen. And I'm Leanna Finley. Our Thank you guys. Okay. Thanks, you Elizabeth. Clear and I yeah. have to restart this computer. So thanks for my good program. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Elizabeth. Yes. We appreciate it. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.